This episode of the Martial Arts Icons Podcast is brought to you by Twin Dragons USA. Twin Dragons USA. Etsy.com slash shop slash Twin Dragons USA. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Martial Arts Icons podcast. I'm your host, Ray Aldaz, and you're listening to the Martial Arts Icons podcast here on YouTube. Uh, Joining me today is uh, one of the uh, Shida Kim's longest students and a fifth dan in Kimitaki Ryu Ninjitsu. He is also the founder of Dagger Incorporated an open source intelligence and global threat assessment and security company. Joining me now is, uh, he goes by uh, Ken Itaki. That's his uh, ninjutsu name, but his name is uh, Bill Nash, William Nash. Hello, Bill. Thank you for being on the show. Hey, how's it going, guys? How's everybody? P- pretty good. It's good to have you on. Now, um, Tell me, uh, you uh, just released your new book, uh, How I Became a Ninja, but you were also the uh, original author for uh, Ashita Kim's uh, Ninjitsu uh, Ninja Training Camp. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so I grew up in New Jersey, and um, I started training when I was, I was pretty young, and uh, I was in a traditional uh, Okinawan dojo, and... This was right about the time when when um, ninjutsu started coming on full full storm, and Shida Kim books were were the big thing. And of course, back then it was you know who is this masked man, right? Who is who is Ashita Kim? Who right. Nobody's ever seen this. The face, mysterious right? ninja, Ashita Kim, right? <laughs> the, the mysterious and, ninja uh, author. Yeah, without going into too much detail, because you got to get the book to, to to get the details. And you read the book, so you know what I'm where I'm going here. Absolutely. Um, you know, my, my uh, instructors. I was getting ready to take my black belt test, and they they were like, "Hey, you know, we got an invitation to go to this training camp." And we used to get them quite often. Joe Lewis, Superfoot Wallace, but those were seminars. This was like a week long training camp, so it was totally different. Right. And uh, my teacher was like, hey, you know, Bill, we'd like you to go because I was young. And they were like, they really wanted me to find out essentially, you know, who she Kim was. They're like, if you can get some pictures of his face, if you can find out what the story is. And of course, they thought, you know, that he was. Uh, fraud and whatever they were really right. to, they wanted you to, to expose him they wanted they wanted yeah. you to expose the sheet again essentially they wanted you to be a spy yeah and so that's that's you know if you if you read the, the you know um training camp part one you know that um we we basically so while i was there i kept a journal and ultimately um from training with Training at the camp, I realized uh, this guy's amazing and was something was really what I was what I was looking for, you know. And so I end up just getting the courage up and you know going to see him. Uh, asked if I could speak with him privately, and he said yes. And then I, I I sat with him and we talked, and I basically confessed. And um, true to his nature. Um, He's an extremely kind person. Um, if you get on his bad side, that's a different story. Oh yeah, he'll <laughs> but, he'll hit you with the uh, with the dance of death, the 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 palms of death, the, the hands of death. <laughs> yeah, he'll just he'll just uh, it, it won't be good. But you know, he was he he, he was really uh, he he loved how I did throughout the camp. He, he thought I really put in a lot of effort. And, um, you know, I put out a lot as far as 
physically and, and push myself and he, he he was happy with that and so it kind of was like you know a time would like to welcome you into the Kimitaki family and then of course if you if you get part two you'll see that there were some more things that happened um in that book and so i'll say that um there's a disclaimer in the beginning of the book saying that it's fictional and stuff like that, and that's something that's kind of required. I'll say that... Uh, For legal purposes, right? Every, every story has some something rooted in, in its... You know, it's like everything I write is, is based on something. It may not be the correct date or the correct person or even the correct geography, but it's, it's based on a real something that happened. And... and you can tell with the way I write that you don't get those little small details um, that are that are told in the story unless you actually were there. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it, it's hard to get that detail, but so yeah. And, and um, he, being creative person, he is he's one of the most creative people I've ever met. Um, written some upward near eighty books, right? Yeah. Um, and, and has interest in many other things besides ninjutsu, kung fu, and and um, healing, and, and all different things that he's very interested in. Um, and uh, he said, you know, I think that if we, you know, if you because we met afterwards, and um, the book kind of takes you on an adventure, and then after that was done, when we when we got back together, sometime later, he said, hey, you know, we should take that journal. And that's in you know, that story of you coming to basically uh, be a spy. We should put that into a book. And uh, I said, sure. So, you know, at the time we were like, well, you got this 18 year old. I was just turning 19. It, people are going to, you know, maybe not. What are you going to learn? You know, the martial arts were different. It was like, unless you had been training for 20, 30 years, people really didn't listen to you back then. And so it was like, is anybody really going to listen to this 18-year-old? So we decided to, it was his idea to make it anonymous. And that's the way it stayed for 40 years, you know. Wow. Uh, now, your instructors just, from that uh, Okinawan, uh, the original, uh, the, the dojo that you were practicing yeah. as a youth, uh, they, the ones that wanted you to expose uh, Kim, they were basically bribing you with a black belt, right? They say, hey, uh, we'll give you a black belt if you help us expose Ashita Kim. Yeah, I mean, like I said, not to go too deeply into the into. Yeah, I don't want to give away too much of the book, but, but, but you know. But, but yeah, it's an important, it's an important yeah. part that in in thirty in thirty five or thirty six years that the Okinawa Dojo was open, and I loved I loved that that dojo. Uh, they've only produced something or something around twenty five or twenty seven black belts. It wasn't. It was an old school dojo. It was very hard. Most people quit because they would get injured. It was. It was. Um, you know, semi-contact to the face, full contact to the body, no pads. So we weren't even allowed to wear uh, cup protectors. So wow, it, it was it was yeah, it was old, old, old school. And your black belt final exam was you know line up sparring. We had to fight each black belt, and each black belt was going to push you to see if you should be part of the team. And then you would do five man defense, and they didn't pull any punches. You got got beat down, and then the final thing you did was real knife defense and the sensei would attack you with a real knife and when I mean for real not not like a pre planned choreographed thing it was it was like a street fight you know and, and people got cut and people got poked and the guy got stabbed oh, yeah. in the end and so it, it was just a different time you could do that then it wasn't a safe space the dojo wasn't a safe space that I can remember being you know in my in my 17 18 going okay there's you know I train four nights a week and I would say okay well I have karate play and that would always scare me a little bit I'd be like oh I know we're doing kumite tonight I know it's going to be brutal oh, and man. I would have that like I would be a little bit hesitant but that yeah. was what that's what transformed the students back then yeah it's not like today <laughs> It's not like today where everybody gets a, a participation trophy. Back in those days, it was real, uh, you know, hard nosed, yeah. tough yeah. training, really tough. It was, a, it was, it was, it wasn't a safe place to, to be when you train in a dojo. It was a place where most likely you you were going to get hurt and then have to deal with that injury and keep going and, and so on. But anyway, so um, I had really earned a position to, to take my black belt. And the way it worked was you, you had a written test and then you had to take the physical test, which was in two 
two day test. There was the, the Kata the first day, and then there was the uh, the Kumite the second day. So it was a two day test. Three really, if you want to include the written the written test, which was a hundred questions, and it was all based on karate history and different things like that. So because they wanted you to be knowledgeable in your oh, own written course. test so, also. That's yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was very old school, and so basically what what they were saying to me was, look, we we. Basically, what I think it was, was we don't have anybody else whose parents we don't think will let them go somewhere for a week, right? That's one, number one. And number two, it was like, um, they just they just were like, we, this would help move you into a position where we'd probably be able to get your black belt test uh, uh, sooner than, than later. Sooner, like, we can probably move it along a little bit for you. But they weren't saying, I'm going to give you a black belt. They were saying, we'll give you, give you a chance to... to uh, to take your black belt. Oh, I see. Test, you know? That's still yeah, very that's still very incredible that um I mean you were able to become after the whole ordeal, you're able to become one of uh uh Ashita Kim's uh, uh best students or one of his only students. I've heard him say that he normally doesn't have students, he just has friends who he works out with. Yes, and, and I think that um that that probably uh yeah, that that is a fair assessment. I mean, the thing with with uh, with Master Kim that is different than training with um, with probably another another sensei or another ninjutsu school or dojo or whatever is he's uh, he's extremely he's a person who really thinks out of the box, right? So he he yeah. is was definitely the black sheep in the ninjutsu community because he does things that are a bit unorthodox in a way that is unorthodox. Well, it considered taboo, yeah. some of them. Uh, some people could laugh at some of the things yeah. that he presents, but yeah. I mean, what it falls into is basically the occult martial arts. I mean, mind control, yeah. levitation, dodging of bullets. I mean, you, people could laugh at this stuff, but this is real martial arts, uh, basically the occult martial arts. Well, well, I can tell you that, that um, Every everything he's ever taught me, I felt that I could practice, use in a practical way and apply. And 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 the things that I that I that I wasn't able to use or grasp, I think it was because I probably wasn't at a level where I comprehended it fully yet. You know, and he he's got the way of like you spend an hour with him say let's say you want to do you want to learn how to throw a shuriken so so he would say okay um first thing he's going to do is he's going to say there's the target throw the shuriken at the target like he's not going to give you like stand this way put your body this way he's going to just watch you naturally like what is your natural like when you walk what's your natural gait like what is your natural inclination to throw this at that target right and then he's going to look he's going to look at that and say okay so what are the strengths of what this person's doing what are the weaknesses and then he's going to tell you well instead you know keep your hand maybe try to move your hand this way a little bit or follow through a little more but he's not going to he's not going to tell you put your hand here a put your hand here b put your hand here c i mean he will in a book because that's like he's trying to give somebody the basics of it but but when you become a student he basically takes your strengths and he builds on those and takes your weaknesses and he makes them into strengths. And he, each, each thing is tailored, is tailored for the student. He, he really assesses the person, uh, and, and says, what are the, what does this person need to be a more complete martial artist or a better person? Right. Are they, are they afraid of heights? Are they, of the water, I mean, are they afraid of what you know, and, and what can we do to get them through that? Do are they, are they a person who you know suffers from depression? I mean, it gets it gets very. He's a very deep guy, and um, is an excellent an excellent teacher. And um, yeah, it, it's 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 a what he's able to do is uh, is, is pretty incredible. But yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to to. Uh, Get in there, you know, at a young age, early before my military uh, career, and, and and work with him, and all through that, and sought out his guidance and stuff. You know, um, right? And, and yeah, yeah. Amazing, yeah. You know, it's it's incredible. Yeah, he must think very highly of your skills to uh, taking you on as as a student because 
Yeah, he normally right. He normally doesn't take students. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that you know, and and, he's, and the thing is, it's it's kind of like if you if you um, if you if you think about it, many many teachers okay have students, and as soon as the student asks a question or expresses an interest in another school or another system or another teacher, what what always happens? Their sensei is always like, well, they're they're going to say, you know, the kung fu is not. Kung Fu is not the way you stick with stick with Aikido, right? You know, That's right. That, that Kung Fu stuff's no... They don't want to lose your business. <laughs> they don't want to lose their student. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like if, if you could imagine the way the way I explain it is if you have a bird, right, and it's your pet, and or it's just a bird that you, you know, came to somehow, whatever, you, you nursed it back to health, and you have this bird, and you, and you keep it in a cage, and you're like, oh, it's great, you know. But you want this bird to be, to be as best bird it could be and enjoy all the stuff that, that all the other birds do so you, so if you just hold on to them tight and you don't let them out there um you're never going to really know you know what he could have been so the shit of came essentially opens the cage and says you know if you say to him i want to do kung fu he'll say great he'll 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 hook you up with a kung fu teacher he has no ego with regards to he just wants you to be happy and he wants you to learn and he wants you to enjoy your life and so now think about the bird the bird comes back and and it and it hangs out with you now and now you're going well now now the bird wants to be here it, it chooses to be here yeah. and that's always better than than trapping it right and, and keeping it and so his his whole thing is he He's his, you know, his two most common phrases are "I'm happy to be of service," and um, yeah, he, he'll he'll always say that at the end of most conversations. Uh, it's "I'm happy to be of service," right? And and he'll always say no limits, like just there's no limit. Like you want to do Wing Chun, do Wing Chun. But that's going to make it to do that. You know what I mean? Something that he does is he, he doesn't necessarily instruct. He gives lessons, and there's a difference. Uh, um, much like uh, blood sport, where they say, uh, you know, never uh, never subject yourself to one style. You have an open mind. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, look, we can teach, we can teach a 110-pound, 5-foot person judo we can um against a six foot four guy we can still teach him judo i i mean i don't know you know what what how it's going to work out for him he okay. may have been better he may have been better served studying muay thai or boxing or something where he could you know you know hit hard and move or something you know you know what I'm saying so it's kind of like to each his own yeah to, to each, each his own style and, and, yeah and he, he's just that he's that kind of guy he's also uh, very open minded so when you're training with him if uh, he, he he's very flexible so if he says um, you know there's it's not and that's why when you get his books it, it's not it, you, you learn the different things in the books but there's always some mystery added in there there's always a story there's always some some um something in there that that kind of makes you think about things it's not just a textbook uh, his his books have become a uh, thing of legend it's just some of amazing amazing titles he has now let's get into uh what got you into martial arts so you're a, a lifetime martial artist uh, you know, going back to uh, when you were a kid, I know in your in your book, your latest book, you have pictures of you as a youth practicing, go, going back to, you know, the 1980s. Now, what what got you into, uh, you know, uh, ninjutsu, martial arts? Uh, I, I know that you uh, liked watching The Master with uh, uh, Lee uh, Van Cleef, you know, the, 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 the master with, with you. Your father was a very big influence. You said you watched that show with your father, and he was a very big influence in your martial arts uh, career. Yeah, yeah. Um, so to, to, to back up and answer the questions one at a time, um, the, the, the thing that uh, I, was, I, I, I wanted to play guitar, and um, a bully uh, broke my guitar and beat me up. And, um, yeah, it's tough in Jersey, and, right? You know, it's tough. You gotta be better yeah, learn some Jersey martial arts. Is, 
he, he was he was older than me, or maybe he was just bigger than me and more aggressive. And it was my first it was my first um, experience with a person being violent with me because he was bigger, and, and I had that I felt that fear within me uh, of not of not knowing what to do. And I, I remember thinking, wow, this guy hates me; he's going to hurt me, and he did. And and so I went home. And my dad was like, "Well, this isn't happening." My dad was a marine; he was in World War II. Oh yeah, and he was and he was a boxer in in the in the in the Golden Gloves. And they have nice. I don't think he was a champion or anything. He wasn't a champion or anything, but they had that division. He was in that. And, um, so, of course, he brought me down to uh, Lou Duva's boxing gym. Pattern. Oh wow! Yeah, so I trained with. Lou Duva. I didn't train with Lou Duva. I trained with one well, of Lou Duva's coaches. He he was a spi- um, he was a spicy hothead guy, Lou Duva. I remember. Oh, he, he was he was loud. He was loud. And he knew the boxing game. That's for sure. Yeah, he's a, and, a legend. Um, definitely a legend. Yeah, definitely a legend. So that was at eight years. That was eight years old, or, or a little. Yeah, just turned eight. And and he brought me down there, and I trained for about two months. And to this day, I'll tell you that. I did. To me personally, I don't care if you train jujitsu. I don't care if you train Muay Thai. I don't care if you do traditional karate, Aikido, swordsmanship. To to me, the boxing workout is probably the hardest workout there is. For oh me man! Personally. I can um, tell you firsthand you know, that you uh, you might be I know, right. <laughs> you, you, you recently were you recently competed and, and did pretty well. Huh? Uh, I, I did. Yeah. That. Oh man, that was yeah, fun. Thank you. Yeah, it was an exhibition. It was an exhibition, but uh, if you if you yeah. watch the the highlights, uh, I I have more highlights than him, so I think I did better. <laughs> yeah, I watched I watched the whole thing. It was awesome. I loved it. I loved the whole thing. Well, thank you. But, so so you know because boxing, you know, is is I, I don't want I want to just basically say it's it's kind of like jujitsu in that there's not much there's not much. Um, so, like in karate, there's a lot of formality. There's a lot of bowing. There's a lot of reverence for your teacher. And yes. Stuff like that. In boxing, it's like we're here to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to get in shape to fight. There's no kata. There's I mean, there's drills. There's things. There's it's things. Kumite. Right? But kumite, hundred percent. It's very straightforward. You're gonna hit him. He's gonna hit you. Whoever can do this better, whoever can have bring more skills to the table is probably going to win, whatever, right? You know, and there's experience there too, but the workout for boxing are pretty insane. So anyway, yeah. to go back to your question, so I was about eight, I'm training at a boxing gym with a grown men, and, and some, you know, I was like the youngest kid there, and um, so uh, I, I start getting into where we're sparring and stuff a little bit, and it's only two months in, and I was a shrimp. I was really little, and uh, get popped one day and get a busted nose. So it happens. <laughs> go home. <laughs> go home. And my mom was a nurse, and my dad was a physician. Um, and uh, he had went to medical school after the Marines. And so, but he was a tough guy. He was like you know no whining type of guy. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm at the kitchen table, and my mother's just beside herself because here I am. I look like a raccoon. I got, you know, the two black eyes. And oh, the, man. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I got clocked. And um, my dad's like, you know, well, just like what somebody from that generation would say. He said, Bill's character, you know. And uh, my mom says, no, this is not, we're not doing this. So she hands him a slip of paper, which, you know, okay. And then he opens it, and he's like, okay. So after dinner, he, he drives me down and uh, he drives me down to his karate school and we walk in and with the teachers there and um, he he basically you know goes in the office. My dad was, for, it was that generation where you just like, if your dad said, come over here, you didn't ask why. If your dad said, sit over there, you didn't ask why. He, my dad didn't talk much. Right. He just like hop in the car. He when he, the but car when he did, he did, you listened. That's for sure. Yes. Yes. So, so we, we go down to karate school. He meets with the teacher. I'm sitting out there. He comes out and he says, "Come meet your karate teacher." I walk in and there's this guy and he's like, "I saw you for three years." He goes, "And I don't. I expect you not to miss a lesson." I said, "Okay, yes, sir." And that was it. That was my the way I got into into karate. And I, I, I in the beginning, I hated it. Um, I thought it was, you know. A little weird, you know, with the uniform. 
uniforms and yeah. styling and all this, and but eventually I, I saw what they could do. I saw what a, what a person fully trained uh, could accomplish, and I was like, hey, I want to do that, and, uh, and I just set my, sight, my sights on that until, until I went to the training camp, and so karate is, is, is high school, and, um, or maybe college, and ninjutsu is graduate school. It's, it's next level, and because the way she Kim teaches it, it's not just moves, it's not just running around in, in a black uniform, it's, it's a, a way of thinking. Absolutely. It's a way of thinking. Did you ever beat up that guy that took your guitar? After, <laughs> I think, I it's a think cliffhanger, I man. I was waiting. I, I, I'll tell you what did happen. I, I think they moved, but I could tell you that in high school, um, there uh, we, we we had a terrible problem with bullies in high school, and, and um, I made it my personal mission to catch every single bully because they wouldn't bully me because I started to you know when you do martial arts or you do boxing, you carry yourself in a different way, right? Right. And people people can sense that, like, oh, I think that guy can take care of himself. I talk about it now and I say it's jujitsu ear. Like if you're somewhere and, and somebody starts a crap and you look at the guy and he's got that ear, the jujitsu oh, you know, the, like the, the cauliflower the cauliflower you, you, uh, MMA ear. <laughs> you apologize that you, you apologize and you leave because you know what's coming next, right? I mean so that's that's the way it was back then when we were walking the karate guys and the, and the boxers, we, we walked with it in, a, in a way that told people, okay, this guy, you don't want to mess with this guy. He looks pretty confident, right? So, um, but I, I, they would pick on other kids and just beat them, beat them, beat them, you know, beat them down. And I would, I would not necessarily interject at that point. Sometimes I would stop that fight, but what I would do is I'd make a mental note of that person and, um, I would make sure I caught them alone somewhere, and then I would kick the crap out of them. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so I think I was suspended uh, fourteen times in in uh, in my senior year, and I, I had a, a I, I'm not gonna say I had a li- hit list, but I had a list <laughs> of uh, guys that I, that I wanted to see. And part of it became part of it became, and this is a, a theme in my entire life until now, still today is when I feel fear or I feel uncomfortable about a situation uh, or an activity, I immerse myself in it. So if, so if I'm afraid of a person like a bully, uh, if we're going to, if we're getting into a fight with three guys, I say, Ray, you know, there's one guy there who I don't know if I can really take. I'm going to, I'm going to take him. I want to see what I can do. I want to push myself to that. See if I can right. rise to the challenge and control my fear, you know. Absolutely. Um, that that came from from that first fight where I couldn't fight and I, I didn't know how to fight and I was getting beat up and I didn't know what to do and there was so much fear and anxiety that I thought I never want to feel like this again. And um I, I don't you know, I don't think fighting is good, but I can say you know, I was a bouncer for four years. And I've probably been, I've probably, you know, I talked to Master Cam about it, I've probably been about 60, 70 real bad fights. And eventually, um, they remind me of, uh, have you ever heard of the book, The Book of Five Rings by Musashi? Yes. Miriam yeah. Musashi, yeah. There's a passage in there where he talks about, like, when fighting and not fighting are the same, become the same thing. You've, you've arrived at a certain level. Meaning, when you can go into a fight, and your heart rate's not racing, and you're and you're not shaking, and you're not angry, and you just handle the situation and you walk away. And so the last altercation I had, which was about two years ago, I was sticking up for uh, someone being bullied. Um, when it was over, I realized my heart rate didn't go up. I wasn't breathing heavy. I was like completely normal, and I was thinking, hmm, it's a different level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and. So yeah, that's where it all started. Uh, but like I said, once once I was exposed to Master Kim, it created that mystery. And, and yeah, back in those, I mean, we're a product of our environment, we're a product of our time, right? And and so for me, you know, the, the television show, The Master, where you have this older teacher and you 
have this younger student, and he's gonna he's gonna pass on these secrets, you know. Um, and I can remember my karate teacher one time talking about. I'll never forget this. It was very discouraging. He said he said to us one day we were working out, and he stopped at the end of class. He said. The only, you know, the only thing you can do is work out really hard. You just have to put in the time and work out hard. No one's going to open up a little, a little secret box and, and show you these secrets and impart these secrets to you that are going to make you better. You, you have to just sweat and bleed and do the hard work. And when he said that, I thought to myself, yeah, but I really would like someone to open up a box and give me secrets. <laughs> yeah, hey. I saw it in a comic book. I opened up this comic book and said I'd become a ninja master. Hey, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, like, that was really what I want because that's what happens with Shogunuki and, and, and that's what happens with, oh, yeah. with, 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 the, with the master. And, 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 and so that's what I want. And so then I, I met uh, Master Kim and it was like, wait a minute here. This guy breaks all the rules. I mean, nobody likes this guy. Like, like Steve K is never talks about him. Everybody under his name, Hatsumi, you know, no, no one acknowledges right. this guy. I believe um, it's because um, he practices the Koga Ryu Ninjutsu, which is, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. a very, uh, you know, like, like a, a taboo, uh, you know, and a, a, like, again, a, a cult martial arts in a way. Yes. Well, well, so, so yeah. And, and, and so we have different, we have different, um, there's certain things that that that, that we talk about. There's certain things that I can mention. Certain things I can't. But but it's a That's it's right. a closed it's a closed system, which means it's it's he'll teach you certain things. But as far as learning the entirety of the system, there's only a handful of people. It's it's closed. It's kind of like behind behind closed doors. And and part of it is one of the things that we do that's different than other people is, as you mentioned at the beginning of, of the podcast, you know, um, you, you're given an ninjutsu name, and and the reason for that is because so for me, right, uh, as being in the military and then having a company, uh, we keep we keep the ninjutsu side of our life separate. And so you're given a name, which is Kenitaki, and then they, they call me Akuma, which is which is means devil. That's right. Um, but but um, we do that purposely because it's the principle that the ninja, you know, lives in the shadows, he trains in the shadows, and in that part of his life is kind of in the shadows. And so you're given a different name that you're referred to. So essentially, you know, you you can um, carry on a, a, what appears to others to be. Uh, a normal life. Your, your your neighbor Google's you, and they don't find out they're living next door to some crazy ninja guy who throws, you know, has knives and swords and stuff, <laughs> and they get freaked out. So <laughs> it creates some of the mystery. The system, um, the system, Kimitaki. Um, you know, a lot of people have really tried to dig in and find about uh, you know Master Kim Sensei and, and then where the system came from. But but essentially. Um, the story, you know, how all the ninjas fled to the mountains, the Koga and the Iga, they, they fled to the mountains, right? And, right. Uh, and, and then they, they basically hid in monasteries and and uh, became became monks and things. And then when the when the samurai tried to find them to kill them, they, they weren't going to kill monks. They weren't going to kill priests. They weren't going to do that. And they have a code against that. So that's why the ninja pretend to be priests, pretend to be Within, you know, up in the temples. Whereas, right, they're masters of disguise for that that reason alone. Right, but the Kimitaki ninjas went to the city. What was I the see. most, you know, city? And it, what, what, it, they went, didn't go up the mountain, they went down the mountain, they went to the city, and they joined um, forces with the gamblers and the, the, uh, the crooks, kind of. And that's essentially where um, the Yakuza came from. Yakuza and Kimitaki are very close, closely related, and, and the Yakuza has a very wow. bad reputation, and 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 so our our history is not the prettiest, and so that's why we're not really recognized. But it does fit perfectly with the um, the way that the world viewed Ishida Kim, right? Which is like the black sheep. So it's like, <laughs> you know, it's I would expect nothing less. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's uh, the the black sheep of, the, of of martial arts. Your system, absolutely. Well, you have to 
have to say why, and then once you ask the question why, then he's going to explain it and he's going to tell you. And you know, and um, and even though I've always gone and done and trained with other people and done jujitsu, jujitsu and, and swordsmanship and uh, different systems, I've always held this master Kim as my as as the, the my main sensei and my my uh, uh, my mentor and someone who I ask you know advice from just different things like that and he's like I said extremely kind person wow. very kind so. now in the 80s uh, how old were you in the 80s probably like 18 16 yeah, you said- yeah, yeah I, was, I was like 18 yeah because I must have been like maybe uh, 5 or 6 years old and you know I ended up studying uh, Shotokan but mm-hmm. all along I I wanted to do ninjutsu I just didn't know it you know, from watching, yeah. uh, I'm not ashamed to say it, you know, the, the 80s Ninja Turtles. Because they, they use all the the Kabuto style uh, weapons, the ninjutsu weapons, uh, the villains use shuriken. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, you know, back in the 80s, you know, you go out to Pizza Hut and you play the, the Nintendo, uh, the, the Turtles on the arcade. And I remember just uh, being obsessed with, with ni- the idea of ninjutsu because of the turtles. That's that's what got me into uh, into really uh, not just me, but I mean millions and millions of other children at the time because um, oh, yeah. you know that was uh, the pop popular culture was. Uh, I mean ninjutsu really. I mean you couldn't find it anywhere else. You you can't go and, and study ninjutsu at a dojo. Mo- and mostly everything was karate or judo. Uh, you know it was in the movies. That's where you got where right. people got their ninjutsu fix. Right, and 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 so there's there's something that that uh, you know you touched on it. It's like you know yeah, so that's what got you into it. It doesn't really matter what got you into it; it's that you got here. You know what I mean? That's, right. That's what that's what matters. And 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 for me, it was kind of like um, just doing the karate and really excelling at it. Really, really excelling at it, like state champ several times and all these different accolades which I'm only mentioned because they're very short lived as far as you know like I just started thinking there's got to be more there's got to be more I mean I trained for some time with Joe Lewis the kickboxer oh wow um, I, I, I I would travel and, and go to his dojo and and um, I met him at a seminar and then we, we, we trained several times together he was a very charismatic guy um, I trained with um, a very famous um, in, the, in the martial arts world in Japan a very famous um, swordsman who who uh, who was a, a, a not a student but a student along he was a student a fellow student under a master uh, Don Drager and who is well known in the martial arts, and so so I, I had some really great teachers, but it was always like what you see is what you get, and nothing that I, I always felt. I always came away from things feeling like there's, there's got to be more. Yeah. And and only only when I met uh, Master Kim um, did I because because you, you, you'd go to Master Kim and you'd say. Um, sensei, I, I really would love to learn how to do this. And he's not like the kind of person that's like, well, you're not ready yet. I mean, if, if, if you're not ready, you're not ready, right? But 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 he's more the kind of guy that says, okay, well, what do you think you need to do to, to train for something like that? And what do you think you need to do to to be proficient at that? And, and what are some things? And you say, well, you know, you could say, well, or let's, let's say, for instance, um, I don't know. Uh, something like you you want to be really precise when you throw something so if I throw a a, 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 a dart or I throw a, a shuriken um, I want it like I always told him I hate not, I hate throwing knives I, I am the kunai I, I, right I hate, the kunai I is knives hate I hate throwing knives and the reason I hate throwing knives is because a shuriken has eight sides four sides six sides whatever and I'm like I, I hate wasted time. Like, why am I going to try to throw this knife that only has one side? Because I know in the heat of battle or in the heat of situation, Murphy's Law, it's not going to stick. I'm going to hit him with the handle. So <laughs> I'm like, but if I throw a shuriken, I got eight 
more chances, right? That's <laughs> so right. Here, here, here I am telling this to a master ninja. And he goes to me, if that's what you want to do, then that's what you should do. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's how he is. You know, I one time I said to him, I want to, um, I want to, I want to use, I want to learn how to use common tools as weapons. So I want to get an umbrella. And so he's like, okay. So we spent like weeks working with an umbrella. And eventually I ended up having a, um, a bulletproof uh, umbrella. But, uh, incredible. Walk around, <laughs> yep. Walk around with it. Think about it. You can walk around with that all day long. Nobody's ever going to question you. You can go through your port security. With you, you never know when it's going to rain bullets down on you. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, and, and one of the one of the things I really love about one of the biggest things I love about Shudikin is if you put things he puts things in perspective. He says, so if you're if you're a ninja back in whatever fifteen hundred or whatever, you are going to want the best tools. You are going to want sharpest blades, maybe a good bow, a good arrow. You're you're not going to want like. You're going to want the best tools for your trade. That's right. So if you take that thinking, which is the ninjutsu thinking, which is, you know, have, you know, to have the advantage. And part of having an advantage is to have really good tools, right, for what you're trying to do. Then if you take that thinking and you bring it to our current day, okay, running around with a sword at night is not really going to get you there, right? Because... For me, I'm a firearms guy, so and I use firearms as a tool. So that's what I talked to him about. He's like, "Yeah, firearms are part of my ninjutsu arsenal." That's and, and a lot of guys hate that when I talk about it on, on ninjutsu sites or whatever. But with everything that's going on in our world, can you take a gun away from a person? If a person's got an automatic, you know, uh, automatic rifle, can you? Do you know what to do? Take it away from you. Know how to use it to turn it on them if you need to. Do you know? Like right. a lot of people still, still, a lot of people still train with a wooden gun in their dojo. Well, yeah, I mean, Krav, like, Krav Maga incorporates uh, firearms. Nice. See, so because it's 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 more realistic, and I feel like ninjutsu is all all about being realistic, being prepared, being overly prepared, and having that one little edge over your opponent that one little edge is what, what, what makes you prevail we don't Absolutely. talk Kimitaki that yeah, Kim, it, it, Master Kim never talks about winning okay and, and Kimitaki doesn't talk about winning we talk about prevailing so you and I are in a restaurant my, my, my you know your back is to the wall um, I'm facing you so I can't see behind me but you notice some people coming in you get a feeling that something's not right. It looks like something's going to go down. You say, hey, we got to split. We go out the back door. We get in your car. We speed down the road. Next day, you know, there's a shooting in the restaurant. Four people were killed. We prevailed. We didn't, we didn't beat anyone up. We didn't have to fight. That's right. That, that goes back to the ninja, uh, you know, the creed. It, you know, they, they would get away. Getting away is like a victory in their mind. Once you start thinking winning and losing, sometimes you can you can put yourself in a situation that you shouldn't be in. Yeah, the idea is to strike hard, strike fast, and vanish. That's ninja. Get out of there. Exactly. And prevailing is a major thing that that, uh, that Master Kim has taught me, that you don't always have to have what the world considers a win. You can... Get out of there safely. Of course, if there's, if there's someone there you want to defend, someone who's you know needs your help, that's different. But for the most part, and, it, and especially when we start talking about ego, like two guys pairing off, like a guy getting in your face, and then you feel you have to come back at him, and he comes back at you. It might be as simple as saying, "Hey, man, I'm so sorry. I uh, I didn't mean to upset you. My apologies." And then the person calms down, and then they probably say. Yeah, you're right. Never mind. I'm, I'm sorry. I had a bad day. No, totally cool. It's a verbal, that's, 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 verbal judo. That's ninjutsu. Yeah, that's ninjutsu. <laughs> that's, that's mind control. You just took a guy from a 
the pen and you brought him back down to a three. You took, you calmed him down with your words. And I mean, I don't know. That sounds like mind control to me. And, and it's things like that. Oh that, yeah. That it's not like I'm going to stare at you from across the room and you're going to give me your money. That's not what we're talking about mind control, right? We're talking about getting you to act a certain way based on what, based on how I act. So if you want to control someone else's mind, you have to be in control of your own mind first. That's right. right? That That's a major thing. So yeah, these are all things that I learned from Master Kim because, you know, because he's, he's that guy. He's, he's the guy that's, uh, he's got that open mind. He's, I've never, I've never proposed something to him, a book I wanted to write, something I wanted to learn that he ever, an idea that I had that he ever, ever once said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I never remember him saying that. He might have thought it wasn't a good idea, but he was thinking, I'm going to support my student. I'm going to let him go down that road and maybe figure it out himself. Right? Uh, Uh, It's just a a great, a great person. You know, phenomenal. Oh, yeah. We we had him on the podcast. He was the inaugural a uh, guest from my podcast that, that I gotta I gotta say that's one of the the best podcasts I've ever I've ever conducted I mean just uh just a a, a fountain a library of, of information on uh, yeah, ninjutsu you, you, and martial arts you know how to kick them off that was quite the kickoff uh, <laughs> <laughs> with you know oh, so, yeah. you know another th- another thing that's interesting is um, he's a very open person like him on your podcast he, uh, he was interviewed by Anthony Cummins. You know who that is, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so he's, he's he's the researcher, right? He's a man. He's the guy who's going around and and dispelling everybody's lineage. And um, you know, while while he still felt that Shida Kim's lineage wasn't wasn't uh, he couldn't authenticate it, he said he went. He's writing this book, and he went to Atsumi. He went to Hayes. He went to every person who teaches in this and he basically like that's you know really well known and he said i'd love to interview you i'm going to give you an opportunity to to talk before i write the book and out of all the people he contact uh master kim is the only one who responded and the only one who went on his show and the only one he interviewed and so he has a post up that says the kim is the only real ninja because wow. <laughs> he was the only one who wasn't worried about you know because at the end of the day right who do you who do you have to please yourself you, who, who do you have to prove anything to nobody you, you want to make sure you're you're happy with your life and you want to make sure your your teacher is happy with you that is that is really as far as it needs to go you don't need the world to say oh you know because i've had people contact me constantly who was his teacher and do you have any documentation and do you have any lineage stuff yeah can I get no <laughs> you're not you're not a member of Kimitaki Guru Dojo on the inner circles and we don't we just don't do that well, that's not the way it works you know it's um originally yeah it was a yeah. secret society but basically martial arts it was only practiced by the <laughs> very uh, high level and rich elites and they kept secrets it's still to this day he, in many of in many of uh, Kim's books, he'll tell you, you know, he, he was silent for a long time until a certain ninja broke that silence. And when that happened, then he said, "Okay, well, I'm going to present my the you know my system to the world," and and he did. And and um, you know, he's just uh, he loves nothing more. When you when you buy, I can tell you this for a second. When you purchase a book from Master Kim, okay? DojoPress.com. Yes, at DojoPress.com. I assure you, he yes, he put time into the book. He had to publish the book. And he has to mail the book, and that's where the money comes in. He's not going. Oh, I just made thirty bucks. He's not thinking that. What he's thinking is, I can't wait to get this book in this person's hands. Like he, he just is excited for you to get this. Book. And, and I gotta, I gotta tell you, I hate to interrupt you, but I gotta, I gotta say thank you to you and Master Kim for sending me a signed copy of How I Became a Ninja, your uh, recent publication. I mean, it, it just uh, hit me like a ton of bricks when I saw that he uh, 
also personally autographed. That was very, very nice to oh, you yeah. guys. Th- thank you guys so much. So, so at my age, or I'm 53, at my age, I can tell you, there's days I still wake up and think to myself, I cannot believe I'm, I know a master's huge kid and I'm a student. There are still days that that happens where I'll look at something he gave me, a, a knife, a sword, a picture he drew, you know, some of his weapons, uh, things of that nature, you know, that were his personal items. And I go, I'm looking at him, I can't believe that's shit kids. I can't believe it. I saw that, I saw this weapon in whatever book back in the 80s, you know what I mean? It, when you go to his house, you're like, I, the backdrop looks, yeah, I remember this. That's the building the guy jumped off of. You know, a lot of the stuff was shot right in his backyard and, uh, it, yeah, you just like it brings you right back to when you were a kid and stuff. And uh, so, yeah. yeah. You recently so, you recently trained with him at his dojo too. You're helping him uh, build a, a dojo also. Yeah. So, um, what what we're doing is uh, I've I basically have purchased some some property um, and a nice a nice size piece of property and. Uh, I, I'm going to build a traditional uh, dojo there. Uh, and it's basically dedicated to, to Master Canvas, the Shida Kim Dojo. And uh, we're going to have an opportunity for people to come train. Um, and, and they're not training under me or anything like that. They're training with me and they're training with Master Kim uh, if they if they want to and, and try to maybe we might do something like a yearly get together like maybe a shooting camp training camp who knows <laughs> that's incredible that's amazing yeah. now, now the world today you know the the world today doesn't seem to have much use for ninjas you know other than in the world of clandestine government operations and that's uh when your when your company dagger comes in dagger inc tell us about that yeah so so it goes back to uh my time in the military, which uh, I saw, I saw an advertisement for for Navy SEALs, and I and I, and I decided to go and, and try out for that. And I made it. I made it to SEAL training. I made it to the school, and was in training and doing quite well. And then uh, I had an issue. Uh, I got to I got to a, a, a I got to basically an argument with an instructor and. No excuses, my fault. He was he's the instructor, I was a student, but uh, there's always extenuating circumstances. So anyway, um, I ended up getting in trouble, and uh, meanwhile, I was there with like 10 of my best friends who are all SEALs, and who some of them are still SEALs in, in uh, SEAL Team 6, and um, been, in, been in for 30 years. <clears throat> so Amazing. my aspiration was to be a SEAL. And, uh, and then when, when I got into trouble uh, I still had some time in the military to do and, and they gave me an option I went before a very old school uh, captain who they, they decide your fate right and uh, it's not like a court it's it's military it's different and the captain reviewed everything and he was impressed with some of my scores and he was impressed with with the way I spoke I guess and, and he just was asking me questions I answered and then he basically said uh what do I want to do? He said, I can let you out of military dishonorably or do you want to stay in the Navy? Do you, do you want to serve your country? And I said, I'll serve my country doing whatever I figured because I screwed up. Uh, I figured whatever I have to do for the next two years, it's just two years. I'll do it. And, um, he said, well, I have, a, I have an idea. And, he, and so everything concluded and, uh, I'm staying in the Navy I definitely didn't want a dishonorable discharge. My father would have not been happy about that. And um, so uh, from there, he said, I want you to go to this, uh, I want you to go to this office and speak to this guy. And he's going to call me when you get there and we're going to have a conversation. And so I went and I met with this guy and he said, I think this person would be perfect for um, some training with you. And that's all it was at the time was some training with you. And I was thinking, who are you and where are we training? Uh, but I knew enough 
off, just did not say a word. Uh, he said, if you want to, if you want to, uh, do this, um, then be here at this time. And, you know, you're going to have to be a plane ticket for you and come to Virginia. Cause I was in, I was in California. So that's what I did. And I, I trained in Virginia and I, I was there for about, uh, four months and it was, um, it was, it was interesting. It was black operation, black ops stuff. It was clandestine services. Um, uh, it's similar to like the group uh, Blackwater Academy, right? Well, those are private contractors. This I, was a right. government. This was still military, yeah. This was a, it's a clandestine services or special. And they're activity. more uh, on the mercenary side. Well, they're, they're, um, they're, they're a branch of the military. It's called the Special Activities Division. They're, they're a clandestine group. And so that's really all I can tell you about that uh anybody wants to learn about those guys they can google it but uh so i went there i went through training i was the only person who wasn't a college graduate and i graduated first in my class from there because i just uh i don't know i'm just an overachiever when when i was nervous that i wasn't going to do well so i overdid everything and over prepared and over studied and over you know and uh did really well so anyway from That's there, good. I went out, and the book covers some stuff, and of course, the book's all, air, I'm doing air quotes right now, fictitious, and uh, it's all fabricated from my imagination, keep in mind, people, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, legal, legal disclaimer. <laughs> legal disclaimer, and um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I spent some time doing that, and then, then I got out of, I got out of the, uh, of the military. And um, I went to work for a uh, a government, a military contractor in Virginia. Their office was actually in Washington D.C., but they were in Virginia and worked with with a, a gentleman who I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, he, he's a pretty well known guy. Um, so I worked with this company for several years and learned, got some really good experience, and. Um, so he was an author. That's all I'm going to say. And uh, he was one of the first authors to write about um, uh, his experiences in the military. Before that, it had been done very little. Most times, people didn't talk about it. And he really was the one who created that genre of, of guys that were special operators that write about their exploits. So um, anyway, so I was there for a few years left. And then I basically... Uh, uh, you know, came home. I, I, I got married, had some kids. Through that time, I stayed in touch with my my seal buddies, and some some passed away. Some um, some uh, you know didn't didn't do so well. Some were injured, and then some did fine and stayed in. And I developed this uh, company called uh, called Dagger, and uh, it basically. Uh, is a, is, a, is a government contractor. But the thing about it is that we all know who the government contractors are. We know, you know, Blackwater and Academy and yeah. Canopy and um, no one knows who we are. Um, you won't find any paperwork on us. You won't find, I mean, we have a, we have a, we were going to put, we had a website, we're going to put another one up, but it's just for clients. It's like, it's just a dagger screen and you enter it. It's like clients press here, enter your client number. That's it. it that's all there is. There's no explanation. But, uh, so anyway, uh, so that was for 20, almost 20 years doing, doing that, um, stuff. And it was, uh, everything from finding missing children who were, who were, uh, you know, something as simple as kidnap, kidnap children. You're right. Yeah, or somebody like, you know, a, a parent or divorce and the, the one parent won't return the child, you know, after their visitation's over for the summer or something, you know, and we would go and, and get the kid back as long as it was verified it was legal and law, you know, law, you know court ordered. And then to bounty hunting, um, which sounds a lot more exciting than it actually is. Um, <laughs> Well, you mean it's not like the show Dog, the Bounty Hunter? 
They should send you guys. They should send you guys over to uh, the Middle East to take those uh, hostages, the, the Israeli hostages. I mean, so, that's the kind of stuff you guys would do, right? Something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's it's. We were supposed to be going on a. It's not, it's in my book, so I'm not really going to go into. We were supposed to be going to this other country around Christmas time to do some stuff and and intelligence. I'm very strict with with the intelligence that we get on what we're doing, and if all the boxes aren't checked, I I, I call it. We're not going because we're not in the military, and we can't really call in for. Marines and air support. Once we're there, we're there. I mean, we have a company that would come and extract us, if, which we pay a lot of money for. But uh, it, you know, it, it's just—it's not like you have the backing of the of the uh, of the of the U.S. government. And, and part of it is, um, you know, the CIA can't operate on American soil, and right. there's certain things that America can't do, but a contractor hired by America can do. And they've always gotten around it that way. And, uh, but it's one of those things where, you know, you're, it's kind of, it, it, it's a little bit like the, we have 22 guys. It's a little bit like the movie, uh, Expendables. I mean, I gotta be honest with you. It's a little bit like some wild dudes that do some wild stuff and then they come home and they don't know really what to do with themselves. Oh, man. <laughs> but, but I do. I have Master Kim. So, We'll write a book. We'll, you know, um, now I have this property and this land. I'm going to be developing. I'm uh, building my residence, a house. I'm building a dojo. So I have other things because I'm not going to be able to do it forever. Recently, we just did an operation in Georgia, which I was one of the first ones in 20 years where I was not, I, I wasn't boots on the ground. I wasn't there. I was overseeing it, but I, I was letting a second in charge. Um, Take it, take it, and roll with MC, and they did great. So, I may not be needed any longer. Who knows? <laughs> right. Well, you um, you you're gonna be writing about it in your uh, coming uh, book series, right? Uh, the Dagger Team Operation Alpha. That's yeah, coming so soon. I have a series, yeah, I have a series of books that I'm coming out with, and and it's um, it's you know, it's really, it's really uh, kind of situation where it seems to me like everybody that's been in combat or been in, in a ranger or a green beret or a seal they you know they do a couple years they do a couple of platoons and they get out and then they write a book right this is this is really just different the, the, the dagger series is different it's um it's a little bit edgy it's definitely not something that if it goes to audiobook you want to play with your wife or kid in the car <laughs> A lot of machine gun, machine gun sound effects. It's just the boys' club. Uh, it's the boys' club type uh, dialogue that goes back and forth in those situations that not everybody can appreciate. And and the thing, it's it, it's violent in some areas, but but what we do at some times is violent, and there's no getting around that. And uh, it's just the reality of. And it's our reality. It's not everybody's reality. Many people are offended by it, but they're still protected. They're still protected by people who are violent, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you need those people. You need those scary, aggressive uh, people. And they're going to keep things safe, you know, that you can sleep at night knowing they're, they got your back. And Yeah, I don't so see uh, I don't see a pink-haired drag queen uh, protecting my life, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and so the book, the, the Dagger series, is essentially 20 years of operations wow. uh, around the world. And, and again, uh, there's got to be a disclaimer that, you know, they're it's fictitious and it's the names and dates have been changed and any association with 
anybody in real life is, is coincidental and all that or whatever. Um, because if you send your book to the DOD to be reviewed, you might get it back in five years, maybe. And then so much stuff will be redacted that you don't even have a book. So for me, I say, yeah, I say to myself, write it and where chips fall, where they fall, you know. But I have the disclaimer, and, and, and the reason I decided to write the book was because uh, a lot of my friends... Um, you know, paid the ultimate sacrifice right. uh, one way or another. Uh, and they're in the book, they're in the stories. And so it's kind of for, you know, it's kind of like to give, uh, to, to honor them a bit. And the stories are high speed, they're funny, they're aggressive, they'll get you pumped up. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a good series, and it, like I said, it, it's I got a, I got a lot of them in the works. Uh, several editions. I'm thinking of, of releasing like one every every year, or every two years, or something. Um, I don't want to like saturate everybody with it, but like maybe one every two years or something. But uh, yeah, and it's um, it's a, it's, it's kind of like you're coming along with me for the ride. It's not just you're reading about what we did. It's like you're in the moment with me while we're doing this. And you're in the driver's seat with you, yeah. You're right with me. You know, we're not telling you how I went down the road and made a right. I'm like, we're traveling down the road, we made a right. You know, it's, it's you're in the seat with me. If you're paying attention, you're going to be like, wow, you know, this is, this is, this is cool. But um, I enjoyed it, and, and, and the books just seem to, like, roll right out. There's not a whole lot of, I don't, I don't, uh, have a thing where I write every day. I might just write for four hours one day, and then a week later write for six hours, and it just it just comes out pretty pretty quick. And, and part of it is too, you know, just seeing how much she, Kim has done and how many books she's written on different things. It's like wow, you know. I mean, yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a bigger book, and and um, it'll be it'll be fun. But it kind of encompasses uh, the whole picture of, of what we do at Dagger and what we've done I should say at Dagger and um, yeah it's just a it's just a good time you know Incredible. so I'm enjoying it well will that book be will that book series be available on uh, dojopress.com yeah so on this one we're gonna we're probably gonna um, we're probably gonna go go with uh, uh, well, it'll be available on Dojo Press it'll be available probably on Amazon it'll be it's going to be available soft cover, hard cover. I'm on it to be uh, available in audio. I'll narrate it. So, um, and yeah, it'll be like kind of a little bit of a bigger, a bigger launch. And we'll see what happens with it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just, you know, it's not entirely impossible that I'll get a knock on the door. Who knows? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I really enjoyed uh, the book, uh, How I Became a Ninja. She to Kim's Training Camp Part 2. Uh, thank you guys for sending it to me. And that book is available now on uh, dojopress.com. I mean, just just a, a great, fun read, uh, an amazing uh, life story, uh, you know, your life in uh, martial arts and how you came about to being uh, Ashita Kim's longest uh, student. So, um, yeah, it's been great having you on. Uh, now, before we go... Um, I wanted to talk about your brick breaking technique. Well, not really brick breaking. You tend to want to break uh, more uh, natural stones rather than bricks. Tell me about your technique. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of, of uh, Master Yama. He's, he's a, he was a big uh, influence on my, my hand conditioning and training. Absolutely. You know, he, he went and trained in seclusion in a mountain for, for like a year or so, 13 months and came down and he was a different person. He was very focused on hand conditioning. And um, in Goju, which is the Okinawan system that I trained in as, as a young person, um, we always had hand conditioning. And then later my sword teacher uh, introduced me to um, did the job, the, 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 um, it, it's the, it's the liniment oil that you use to, to, uh, condition your hands as well. When you're doing hand conditioning, you should use the Sidet because there's 
chakras in your hands and you can get all into that but it basically takes care of your hands so you don't get arthritis you don't get you know, unlike you know, the the makiwara could be a little bit more yeah. uh, strenuous exactly exactly it controls your inflammation it controls any any bone injuries or anything chance but anyway so yeah the, the the whole thing with with um with 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 uh breaking and and tame shuari it's called is 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 my whole concept was and it was another another martial arts name is Sikiana. It was, you know, one punch, one kill is what they used to say it. So ending a fight nice. with one strike. And so that that seems brutal to some people, but if there's three people and there's only one of you, you know, it'd be nice to just be able to hit one person each and they're you're done, and I don't. I don't mean like you know in the movies the way the movies are. No fight's ever gonna go like that. No, no. But <laughs> That's fighting, fighting is ugly. <laughs> yeah, fighting is fighting is ugly. It's scary. It's dangerous. It's brutal. It, no one ever really wins. Someone always gets hurt. Everybody unexpected, gets hurt. unexpected but, moves. Yes, yes. I used to tell my students, you know, get out of the dojo. You know, I, I, whenever I go to teach at a dojo as a guest teacher, first thing I do is I make everybody put their shoes on and come out into the parking lot. Let's train out back here. Forget the dojo, air conditioned, nice floor, everything's perfect, everything's nice, you're all comfy, take all your belts off. You know, I know you fight better with your black belt on, but come on, you don't, you know, put your t-shirt on. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like, let's do some real stuff out here. My point is that, yeah. that, 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 you know, the reality of fights is not pretty. And so I developed this idea years ago from reading from reading Yama's books that, um, and in fact, it's interesting because my, the way I stumbled upon it, it's always, it's always, I've always had really good luck with teachers, finding teachers or teachers accepting me as students. I, I trained under some really great guys, of course, she had been being my, you know, the best, but, but my sister rented an apartment and, and, and when she moved, I helped her move. And when I was helping her move, up on this top shelf in a cabinet was a big, giant, thick book that said, this is karate. And it was by Masoyama. Wow. And when you, I opened it, it was signed. Oh, man. But he had done a U.S. tour, and he had signed it, Tenth Don. And uh, I read this book, and this is where my whole hand conditioning uh, interest came in to be. But, but so it's not iron palm. I don't think it's iron fist. I don't think any of that, but, but um, yeah, I over, basically what I did was just used uh, consistency every day for between 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. I train on, um, I use, I did, I put a video up where I do training on, I have a couple different rocks that I use that I hit back of my hand, the palm of my hand, my fist, and just build up over time. And this has been, you know, like 20 years of doing this. And um, I think I'm at the point where, you know, I'm very confident that if I hit someone, it would stop them with one shot. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm not saying that. I mean, maybe it wouldn't. Maybe he's uh, got a thick... Maybe he's got, you know, a lot of muscle, muscle, muscle around his neck. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. But I've, I've developed an ability to break whatever I hit. It's so, the conditioning. It's a, the conditioning. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, River Rocks. So Amazing. Um, yeah, instead of man-made bricks or concrete slabs or even uh, wood, you know, because most of the time they'll break the wood pine boards with the grain, right? Um, so you have the river rock where you hold it in one hand and you break it is, is a, a real challenge. It took me probably eight years to be able to do that. You know, I'm a, I'm a strong guy. I'm a pretty strong guy myself. And I could tell you, uh, I, I don't think I could break a river rock. I mean, I, I've been, uh, I've videotaped myself doing the Tibetan burning palm. Or the the Frank Duke style uh, dim mock, where you uh, break the the bottom brick, and you know that that to me is an incredible feat itself. But even more incredible is to be able yeah. to break a natural stone. You know that, that's yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. So so it's interesting because 
I don't know how to say this without freaking people out, but but I've never been. I, I, I guess maybe it's my lack of confidence or my lack of of uh, something, but I've never really been too into the super esoteric stuff like the like the secret chi power and, and Master Kim totally is, and he he he's written books on it. And I've read them, and I just I just I've always gone back to the basics of relying on my my I guess my physical ability and, and maybe that eventually is going to wear out but that's why I have handguns you know and so but <laughs> I mean I just I just always uh, had a hard time developing that to where I could see it work or maybe I was doing it wrong or maybe I didn't have enough patience but no I think you're doing mean? it right I mean essentially you are yeah. Uh, harnessing your chi in order to break that river rock. So yeah, you, you're you're doing it right. And anytime yeah. you use uh, that kind of power, it's it's definitely uh, from your chi. It's energy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, and it's a thing where you. It's a real, it's a real pain. Like 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 uh, you got to do it every day. And and, and you, you know, yes. I don't tell anybody out there who trains in martial arts or trains in anything. It's, it's those days when you don't want to train oh, that, yeah. that matter the most. It's what matters the most. A very, very, really uh, special person in my life. He, he, uh, I met him when he was uh, 18. Uh, he was in SEAL training with me. He became a SEAL. He's been a SEAL for 30 years. Uh, he's an incredible person. Um, and he one time told me something that every once in a while someone will tell you something that sticks with you for the rest of your life. And what he told me was, um, uh, he, he, I, I, I was concerned about a friend of mine's kids. My friend died and his kids uh, only missed one day of school. And I said to him, don't you think you need to take some time and, and you know, go through the mourning process and stuff? And, and, and they said, no, my dad would be upset with us if we used this as an excuse to fall behind in school. And so I said that to my friend. And, and I was looking for him to say, someone should, should talk to these kids and, it, you know, they definitely need to take some time off. Instead, what he said to me was, so when you are on a path and something happens and then you change just for one day off that path and then one day goes to two and two days goes to three and then that's who you are. Wow. So what he was saying is once you change from your goal, once you change once you deviate. With an excuse, with, once you deviate from that, one day, two days, three days, now that's who you are. And most people don't come back. They just stay on that right and and I I've, I've never forgotten that. I would be like, Oh, I don't I don't feel like doing it today or I'm going ready for this. I'm going on vacation. Oh, here's a good one. I'm going on a cruise. How are you going to get your conditioning on a cruise? Uh, you, you know what I mean? I find myself practicing uh, martial arts uh, even in any circumstance, even while I'm driving a car. I mean, you ne- you always have you always have time to practice, I think. It's, it's just a way me. of life, right? It's, it's, it's a way of life. And yes. For guys like you and me and, and Master Kim, it's a, it's a way of life. It's like breathing or, or or anything else. I mean, I brought a little flat. I had a flat. I don't know if you know what flagstone is, but it's a it's about the size of a, a, a maybe a little bigger than a saucer. Uh, I brought this rock and I put it in my suitcase on the plane. I mean, I'm on the boat, and I had this rock and I would I was hand conditioning in the rock every morning. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and my wife, God love her, you know she. When we first met, uh, my, it's my new wife, seven years. She, she didn't even know I did karate. And I used to just like get up early, do my thing. And she just didn't know how involved I was with it and, and ninjutsu and all the ninjutsu stuff is like, she's just so like cool with it. She's just like, yeah, it's cool. You know, yeah, I just I recently trained with Master Kim. I usually go to see him, um, uh, I try to get there two or three times a, a month to, to go and train with him, spend some time with him. And a lot of times we'll, we'll train, but then a lot of times we'll just sit in his in his, uh, his living room and talk, talk about ideas, talk about different things. Like I'm, 
I have so many ideas. I want to, I'm, I'm, you know, we want to put together a, a website with things that he's endorsed and things that, like, different weapons, like a line of knives, a line of shuriken, um, different Bashida Kim stuff. Yeah. That we're basically going to test. And, you know, we want to get some, some, some merchandise, some clothes, some vintage T-shirts from the training camp and, and pull them out of the, pull them out of the, you know, out of his, out of his uh, storage and, and, and we, we make some t-shirts and different things and um, provide people with some opportunities to, to get that stuff, you know, because... Absolutely. Like, you know, shuriken are hard to find. I, I just bought some, believe it or not, and, uh, you know, they're really, really uh, so, good quality ones, but they're very hard to find. I, I'd love I'd love it if uh, Master Kim had some in the store and uh, buy them directly well, from him. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that's very unique um, and something that we're going to be doing at the Ishii Kim Dojo that, that not, I, I don't know that anybody does this, but this is something that we're going to do and I've already spoken with him and got his blessing. But I'm, I've always been a... Um, very handy with tools and welding and, 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 and you name it, any tool. And um, we're going to we're gonna have students, like they come in for like a two or three day class. So by the way, the dojo is going to have accommodations for eight to 12 people today there. Um, oh, amazing. Overnight and, and have a place to sleep and then have a, a kitchen and bathroom and everything, you know, a laundry facility, the whole nine yards. And, and incorporated in this is um, we're going to have our own uh, blacksmith shop. So nice. students can show up. Students can show up on a Friday, and we're going to say, "Okay, so the, 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 we're going to be studying." You know, sh- shuriken. So sounds right gonna, up my alley, yeah. man. My dad was we're, a welder we're, himself. We're gonna teach, yep, we're going to teach him how to fabricate the shuriken, how to how to cut them, how to sharpen them, how to polish them. And so when you have your four or five shuriken, whatever we make, the whole class gets together, makes this on Friday, whatever, Friday, you know, Saturday, whatever. And then the next day or next two days are going to be spent using that weapon and learning that weapon and, and becoming familiar with that weapon and proficient with that weapon. And then you get at the end, you get to take that weapon home if you're flying, we'll just mail it to you. But you get to keep those weapons. And so essentially, if somebody were to go through and come in and train, they'll end up with their full set of weapons that they made themselves, right? Incredible. Um, yeah, they can get pricey, right? I, mean, I remember reading in your book, your your dad bought you, uh, back in the day, $900 worth of the, the ninja weapons. <laughs> yeah, it's pricey, but this will be, it'll all be included. So like say a weekend's a few hundred bucks to come and, you know, we're going to put you up and we're going to train and then we're going to uh, have time, downtime where we can just sit and chat and have a barbecue and then we're going to make our weapons and then you get to keep the weapons at the end. They don't cost anything. I mean, if they're included in, in whatever it was for you to stay there and if, I want to make it affordable for that normal average people. This is not something that we want to make that's out of reach. Yeah, extravagant, people, you know I mean? yeah. <laughs> Even though it is in yeah, Florida yeah. and it's very nice over there, it's like a vacation getaway, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's that's something that's pretty unique. So we'll have like Kasari Kama teach you how to make a Kasari Kama, or you know, t- teach you how to do these different, make these different weapons that essentially you can keep, and that that has a, a lot of meaning to it, you know. And, Absolutely. Uh, and and then of course there'll be times when Yoshida Kim himself will be there, and and uh, you know, teaching class and. and being involved and overseeing things and and uh, not in an authoritative way. He's not that type of person. He's a, he's more of a get to know you, enjoy your company, you enjoy his company, you learn something, you have fun, um, and that type of thing. You know, it's 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 a very enjoyable experience. Well, I think it would be a, a phenomenal experience to be able to train yeah. with the legendary. Ninjutsu master, who I call one of the founding fathers of American Ninjutsu, Ishida Kim. Um, I'm definitely going to want to look into it myself. I would love to train with you guys. Yeah, and and and, and that's that's it's you know like you're saying. I mean, Ninjutsu. Some people don't care about it, but the people who do, that's the people. That's our, our that's our that's our you know our target audience. The people that care about it and want to do it, and 
for me, for me, it's okay. So I'm younger than Master Kim, obviously. And my thing is, you know, what is what my thing has always been, and he knows this. Like, what is his legacy? Like, once he's gone and we've lost this great, this great uh, person and, and all of their knowledge, what is there in place to, to keep it to keep it going? Pass it on. So, so you know, he, he's he's working on books that are not published. He's he's working on books that will be released after he passes away, potentially. Uh, that I would be I'd be in charge of making sure that that happens. And so he has a legacy. I, I really, I really uh, definitely love the guy. Uh, like a like a dad, he he's definitely been a really positive uh, figure. And in fact, with Dagger, we've we've even he's a he's a consultant for for Dagger. And um, you know, if I'm going to do something recently, we were going to do an operation, and we talked, and and he said, in his opinion, he didn't feel it was that we had. Because I'm, I'm ready to go. Like I want to put my boots on. Let's roll. Let's let's do this. And totally. it's hard to hold me back. It's hard to hold me back, right? And and um, he's like, I think you need to pass on this one. And and as hard as it was, I, he's the consultant, and I passed on it. And my guys were not happy. They were not happy. Um, and then and it's probably for your their own good. They don't even know. He's like an oracle, you know. Later, we turned on the television, and right now there's like civil unrest there. It's like a massive hot spot. There's people trapped. They let all the people out of prison. It's Haiti, crazy. It's in Haiti, yeah, right? Well, I, I can't. Yeah, I can't. I, I can't. I, well, can't I, I, I put <laughs> it. I put it together. Oh man, you yeah, know what? Yeah. It, it, there's zombies there, so it's a good thing you guys didn't go, man. But, but <laughs> we were getting ready to go, and 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 we were going to be there for a month, and. Uh, he, he was like, no. And as bad as I... Wise decision. Didn't want to listen. So, so he's always had my best interest in mind. He's just a, a superior person. I have the utmost respect for him. And, um, you know, it's, you know what another really great thing about him is, is uh, he's got so many detractors, so many people that hate him, and so many people that talk terribly about him. Oh, yeah. Do you ever see how he handles that? Never does. He's just like, whatever. He's like, whatever. And they just and, he brushes them off like uh, uh, like a, a, a matador brushing off a, a bull, just you know, yeah, but, but gracefully. Man. Well, he'll say he'll say something. The only thing he'll say is they'll be like, you know, you're this, you're this, you're that, you're you're fraud, you're fake, you're phony. Goes and then he'll go, but you heard of me, <laughs> 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 you know, and uh, it's just you know, it's that it's that whole thing. So still today. You know, when I'm driving up to see him, I feel like Max Keller getting ready to go see the master. And uh, what, what am I going to learn this time? What am I going to... I'll get there. I don't know what we're doing. You, you might have a, some ropes climbing, rope climbing going on in this backyard. You might have a... Oh, that's some tough stuff. I don't know. We, yeah. might, we might be repelling off his roof. We might be uh, throwing swords. We might be shooting. We might be... You, you just don't... You don't know. And it's like... Okay, and, and, and our promotions have always been interesting, too, because he's never said, okay, you're going to test for a third-degree black belt, you know, ever, ever. We'd be in a situation, I might say something or, or do something, or he might see me do something, or he might see my, an ability that wasn't there a year ago, and he'll go, you just earned your third-degree black belt. Incredible. And his training essentially helped you during your uh, Navy SEAL, your uh, BUDS Navy SEAL training. It was like uh, ideal training to, to prepare you for, for that for that uh, scenario. Yeah, I mean, you know, people people talk all the time about how, oh, SEALs, if you look on the forums and the different Facebook groups, oh, SEALs don't exist or they don't exist anymore. It's something out of Hollywood. And I said, I said, well, these are guys, these are grown men that get paid to go carry out an operation at night clandestine they have the top of the line weapons they can do all kinds of stuff they can do anything from a from a snatch and grab to a to, to a hunt and kill they, they they get the green light to do many of these things that sounds like a that sounds like a ninja to me it sounds Damn. like a ninja some, and then when you get into the private sector and the contractor sector 
and, and like Dagger, where somebody's saying, hey, my kid joined a, a cult in Georgia. Can you, can you find her? Wow. And, and, and the police don't want to get involved with that. Politically, that's just like, you know, they don't want to... It, takes, it would take forever. We don't have to work within the super confines that the police are... are, 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 are they, they have like... It's like they're, they're hamstring. They, 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 yeah. they can't do so many things. We can. We can go to a bar and start asking questions. We can go... We, we can we can join the call. We can send someone there to join the call. We can use cyber investigators to, to hack things and, and get in there and, and figure things out in a legal manner. But stuff that the cops they they they're, they're, they're limited. They're reason. limited. Yeah, yeah. They have a rough they have a rough time. I, I love law enforcement. I'm, we totally support law enforcement, but. They have a hard, they have a hard job. They, it's like the odds are stacked against them, right? The it's a, devil, it's a double-edged sword, you know. Right? Yeah, I, I support, I support law enforcement, but also I'm aware of, uh, you know, uh, overpowering, overreaching police state. Uh, you know, as I'm sure you know as well. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a double-edged yeah, but they, sword. But they, but they, they're, they're, they're up against bad guys who have no rules. The bad guys don't play by the rules, and that's why there's always this. It's, you know, when we go somewhere, they'll say, well, you're, you're not going to be in a hostile zone. You're going to be behind. You're not going to be behind the wire. Well, that's an invisible line. And you think the bad guys aren't going to cross it. They're just going to go, oh, we can't go on that side of the street. But that's not how that works. Bad guys are bad guys for a reason because they don't follow the rules. That's right. So you... You have, to, you have to think in a similar Reminds fashion. me of the so, stupid, tired gun control argument. Like, you know, like the bad guys are going to obey the, the, the laws. Yeah, Un- it's unbelievable. Just not that, that's, it's just not, not going to happen. So, <clears throat> you know, essentially, um, you know, it, it's, just, it's just always been uh, the stuff that we do with Dagger has always been... Um, you know, a, a thing where we could we could get creative with the, res, the results, and, and Master Kim has always been there to, to say, "Well, hey, why don't you why don't you approach it from this angle?" Mm-hmm. And then he got guys in a room that have been seals, green berets, right for 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 years. And Master Kim says something like, "Well, why don't you think about it like this?" And then everybody just looks at each other and goes, "That's the, that's the secret right there. That's what we got to do." And you're just like, who is this guy? Like, holy crap, where did he learn all of this stuff? And, and uh, yeah, just an amazing guy. And, and I've been really fortunate to, to have this relationship with him. And, 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 and he's, uh, he's, got, he's, has, he's got lots of people that, that have trained with him and things. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. We, we just focus on our relationship and, and and our time together and training, and, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for the guy, and that's why I'm going to create the issue to Kim Dojo, and we're going to make sure his legacy carries on, you know, uh, beyond his years, and, and hopefully has 20 more years, maybe 30, who knows, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wish, um, wish the master high, high health, and um, um, that, that he continues to do the, the great things that he's known for. Absolutely. You you as well. Your story is truly a, an inspiring story. Here on the Martial Arts Icons podcast, just a great, great story. Well, I appreciate, I, I appreciate your time. And, um, you know, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up this, this first book. And I'll send you a copy. And, and oh, thank we, you. We can, we can talk a little about it. We'll talk about that a little bit in the future. Who knows? But, uh. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking with you. And uh, anybody that's interested in in getting a copy of uh, the Shady Kim Training Camp Part Two, just go to simple, simple, easy to remember dojopress dot com. Absolutely. Uh, or Google it or whatever, and you'll 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 find it. Uh, so yeah, it's well, been, it's been that- a real honor. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Bill, for being on the show. And hey, man, I look forward to uh, possibly training with you and the master in Florida. You and Master Kim. Yes. That sounds like a lot yeah, of fun. We'll, we'll, we'll be we'll be sending out some information here eventually. We're I just purchased the property, so there's a little bit of pre-construction to do and, and sorting all that out. And it, right now, it's just a, a big a whole bunch of acres with trees on it, and we've got a 
kind of, it's just the woods. We just got to kind of uh, work it out and, and see how it all shakes out. But yeah, that's the plan. So um, awesome. Yeah, it's been great talking. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Awesome, Bill. Talk to you soon. Thank you. And you send my uh, hellos to uh, Master Kim. And thank you guys for the book. All right, great. Super appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Take it easy. That was Ashita Kim's longest student, one of his only students, top students, uh, Ken Itaki, his his uh, ninjutsu name, but his uh, name is uh, William Nash. And uh, it was a great podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in to the Martial Arts Icons podcast. If you want to support the show, go over to my Etsy store and visit my sponsor, Twin Dragons USA, over at etsy.com slash shop slash Twin Dragons USA. That's etsy.com slash shop slash Twin Dragons USA. Sayonara.